Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for uh, this week's brown bag, uh, or this month's brown bag, rather. Uh, new, new time, same mm -hmm. place on Cisco. Hopefully, uh, in the future, we'll be able to meet in person again. That's our hope. Mm -hmm. and, you know, this is better than nothing. Um, mm -hmm. And this week, we have uh, Julie Rabini as our uh, guest speaker for the for the day. She is the author of several books: uh, Virginia Hamilton, America's Storyteller, Missing Millie Benson and I for an eye sports journalist uh, Christine Brennan and she's also the editor of a collection of novels five novels by Virginia ha Hamilton as well uh, that will be coming out and we're very excited about that and she's also the founder of uh, Claire's Day so uh, today she's going to speak a little bit about uh, Virginia Hamilton for us and share a little bit of history and if you know as we're going along if you have any questions because we are a smaller group Feel free to ask them as we go. Uh, it, it's a fun way to kind of uh, to learn new things and kind of change it up. And you know, it works when we have a little bit of a smaller group. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to our speaker for the day. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And I'd like to thank you and the Sandusky Library for hosting me for today's presentation on Virginia Hamilton. And I will establish, as I offered to you when I first logged on, I am currently at the Rubini Family Homestead in Polk County, uh, North Carolina. And they are known for many things in this beautiful country, but their internet is very suspect. So <laughs> I'm hoping that I'm on Verizon internet as a result because it does come and go. Um, um, so I'm hoping that we don't have any technical issues, but you'll bear with me and, and we'll work through it. So um, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, Claire's Day, uh, as, as Judith Coons knows, who's attending, who has participated in Claire's Day, is a children's book festival that my husband and I established in honor of our daughter, Claire. Claire was just 10 when she left us. And... Um, we felt compelled to honor her in a way that was true to her and to honor our relationships as a family. And consequently, Claire's Day has accomplished honoring her and it's helped us move forward together as a family. We have two other children who are now 29 and 27. Can you believe that? Um, and um, an incredible life and I feel Claire's influence still in my life and I truly believe that this um, opportunity to share Virginia's uh, story and biography form for Ohio University Press, the book was published in 2017 and now I have the honor as Jeremy offered, uh, the Library of America is publishing a collection of five of Virginia's novels to be released this September and I am serving as the editor and it was just so fun to dive back into my research in writing the new chronological biography for Virginia and discovering new um, correspondences and um, letter, letters, just you know, becoming more aware of the incredible Virginia Hamilton. So I think from there we will start um, my presentation again. And we're a smaller group, so feel free to interject with any questions. Um, I do a little bit of reading throughout some of her pivotal moments in her life from my biography. And um, which, by the way, received a star review from Kirkus, which was huge. I didn't even realize how huge that was. And it also landed on the Bank Street College of Education Best Children's Books of 2018 was the list and uh, with outstanding merit, which was very, very honoring and humbling as an author. Um, so let's without further ado, let's get to the PowerPoint. And here we go. And uh, I'll, I'm still going to be here. I'm just going to turn off my video and mute myself, but I will still be okay. here if we need if we need anything. But that's normally just what I do during. Okay, so let's make sure. Oh, there we go. I'm not sure. Let's see. I'm not sure what happened just there. Hmm. Uh, do share again. I can see it, but it's kind of small. Okay, so let me see. I'm really not seeing it from my end, which is odd, but let's see. Okay, here we go. 
Okay, we're getting bigger and we're going to start from. That's better. All right. So let's go back to the start and we should be good. All there right. we go. Here we go with Virginia Hamilton's life journey. That is the cover of the biography. I love the picture um, that we chose. I wanted an image of Virginia, which wasn't the typical traditional kind of iconic image of Virginia. Um, I wanted something that was useful. This is obviously a book for um, children, middle grade to young adults. This picture was taken by her husband, Arnold Adolph, when they were in New York City. And I just think it's beautiful. I think it reflects her joy, her enthusiasm, just incredible. So Virginia was born and raised in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which as a native Ohio, and I'm, I'm just thrilled with to share the stories of our incredible inspirational individuals that live or were raised in Ohio. Uh, there's a baby picture of Virginia, which I think is adorable, and a picture of her mother, Edabel Perry, and her father is there. Again, these are from the book, so it's in better visual in the book, if you will, but her father is in the background of that picture. That's at the Antioch Tea Room, where her father, Kenneth James Hamilton, was the manager of the tea room at Antioch. And then there were no pictures of her grandfather, Levi Perry, who was very instrumental in Virginia's life as well. I begin the opening line to my biography is just so reflective of Virginia's um, life. She was Virginia Hamilton was born into a family of storytelling characters. She was surrounded by storytelling characters. Her mother could spin a yarn like no tomorrow. Her father uh, she, Virginia would say that he would come home from his job at the tea room and he, he'd have his white jacket on and he'd remove his white jacket and he'd pull Virginia, young Virginia, up on his knee and he'd share what she called the knowledge. He would share stories of his African-American heroes from um, baseball players to cabaret singers. Virginia loved to sing. Um, he just stoked her knowledge of those whom she should be aware of. And her mother, meanwhile, on the Perry side, would knit those yarns for um, Virginia. Virginia was the youngest of five children. And um, so consequently, she had a lot of freedom to grow up and, and roam not only the acreage of the family farm, um, but the nearby um, area in Yellow Springs, the huge um, parklands, and she would get lost and she'd use her imaginations. And as she got a little older, she started to write in what she called the notebook. She'd sit on top of the, the um, hot tin roof of the hog barn and she would record these, you know, gossip and stories that she would hear from her family. Very sadly, she lost that notebook um, before she was even in her teens, and she lamented that loss for years. And it was then that she began to write her own fictional stories, and again, fueled by these stories coming from her mother, coming from her father, and even her grandfather, who has a story himself, um, Levi was whisked away, saved from a future of slavery by his mother, who is named Mary Cloud. Um, Mary escaped from her um, owners in Virginia and made her way through the Underground Railroad system, ultimately bringing Levi, who was just a toddler, to um, Jamestown, which was near Yellow Springs. Um, left him with family and then disappeared, never to be heard from again. I love that story. I think there's a story there. Um, Levi fell in love with a woman by the name of Retta James, and her family was from Yellow Springs. So they moved to Yellow Springs. They raised their family, including Etta Bell, and Etta Bell's, I believe she had nine siblings. And every year, Levi would gather his children and eventually grandchildren, including Virginia, and tell them the story of how his mother and how brave she was to escape from slavery 
and bring him to Yellow Springs so that they should know the story so that they should never have to experience the same. Um, there were stories that I feature in the book about, um, oh gosh, just aunts and uncles who were just highfalutin and carrying on characters. And I mean, as a child, just being surrounded by all of that, it is literally no surprise that she turned out to be the incredible crafter of fictional stories for children that she had become. I write that their stories swirled around her like the summertime fireflies that flitted on her family's land in Yellow Springs. So libraries are so important to us all as writers, as readers, as researchers, as um, those who just want to know more about our world and our world around us. And Virginia was, was um, certainly that. She um, had an experience where she was encouraged by her mother um, to look at the various colors of the egg, eggs. Um, so, in, in ultimately looking at the various rainbow layers of the eggs from the chickens, they had over 600 chickens on the farm. Um, Etta was raising their children as well as raising the chickens and raising vegetables and monies from the sale of the chickens and the eggs and from um, the produce off their farm would always buy extras, as Virginia said, like perhaps a new outfit for Easter. Um, so they had Ericana's uh, chickens. And let me share what I write in my book about how this, um, these chickens and um, the library ultimately led to Virginia's love. Her love for the Yellow Springs Library began with a quest to find out more about an exotic breed of chicken her mother had sent away for. Virginia's mother encouraged her to look at the rainbow layers of the eggs from their Araconis chickens. While the chickens roamed about in the yard, Virginia explored the hen house. She discovered the nest held eggs of a variety of colors. Her mother's exotic chickens laid eggs that were turquoise, pink, olive, green, and various shades of brown. When I told my class at school about my job as colored egg gatherer, some of the town kids snickered. Both you and the eggs are colored. I told mama and she said, Go take a look in the library. For what? I wanted to know, Virginia said. For the rainbow layers, Mama said, there's more than one kind of chick with color, more than Araconis. And then she gave me what I thought of as a secret smile. And so it was that Virginia became a regular visitor to the local library. She even thought the sprightly bright-eyed story, story lady lived at the library. Once a week, the story lady visited Virginia and her classmates in elementary school. She walked them across the street and introduced the children to her world of books. I love this quote for, from Virginia. She said, I'd get sideswiped every time by all those straight back sentinels in long still rows, said Virginia. Short books and tall books, blue books and green books. What's in them, I would wonder. They had more colors than the rainbow egg layers ever thought of and a greater supply of subjects. Today, I realized that was my mother's point. Get Virginia to the library and she will find out many things and that she did. So there is a picture of the Yellow Springs Library during Virginia's um, childhood. That is no longer um, the actual Yellow Springs Library. They have a newer building. Um, currently, which now, as you'll see at the end of the program, um, proudly um, has a Virginia Hamilton um, Ohio historical marker on the outside of um, towards the entrance of the um, Yellow Springs Library. But this and this building is still there in Yellow Springs. It is right across the street from the elementary school, and it, I believe has the school administrative offices in it. But it's just such. I mean, to me, that's a quintessential looking little cottage library. Don't wouldn't you want to just go inside and discover all that is found within? So, as I mentioned, um, Virginia, freedom to roam. Um, you know, Yellow Springs has always been a very inclusive community. And uh, that was, you know, it, such was the case too with Virginia growing up there. She roamed, um, she would ride her bike from their home, um, their lands in Yellow Springs, which is just a couple of miles outside of town. 
Um, oftentimes her um, partner in crime was her cousin Marlene and they are shown there together on their bikes. Um, they would often ride up to the library. They would often ride to the little theater, um, which was really about the only, I guess, discrimination that Virginia would experience. Um, during her years and growing up in Yellow Springs, the little theater used to separate um, where blacks and whites could sit in the theater. And I won't go into it now, but there is a story within the biography of how it peacefully was resolved and was no longer segregated. So there's um, Virginia. And again, she would roam. Um, the Glen was the name of is the name of the natural area that is there in Yellow Springs. And and one of my several visits to Yellow Springs, I roamed through the Glen as well and, and recalling some of her notes and specific memories about that incredible parkland and property. Um, it just, it was really kind of cool to experience what Virginia had experienced when she was a child. She went to Bryan High School, which is now Yellow Springs High School. You'll see Virginia there as a cheerleader on the squad. Um, on the right, she's there again with her cousin Marlene. And in the middle is um, Virginia at the far back on the left um, with cousins and um, with friends eating at a restaurant there in Yellow Springs. Um, she just had a, a fun, wonderful, easy, uh, growing up, formative years, formative years, um, just surrounded by love, surrounded by stories, surrounded by extended family. When she was a senior at Bryan High School, she was encouraged to submit an essay for a speech contest um, sponsored by the local Optimist Club. And although she didn't win the contest, she was a finalist. Um, her speech, which I have not seen, um, obviously her talent was recognized as a writer. And for, I don't know if you can see this, I'll hold it up. Virginia went on to write over 200 speeches for in accepting awards and she was sought after as a speaker. Um, and her husband, Arnold Adolph, and Casey Cook served as the editors in collecting these many speeches and some letters. Um, and it's a work titled Spe Speeches, Essays, and Conversations. And it was an incredible resource in writing her biography for I really got a sense of who Virginia was as a writer, as a mom, um, as an author of incredible work. So I highly recommend that as being, if the Sandusky Library doesn't have this in collection, I would <laughs> encourage you to do so. So that's Virginia. And then there's many plot twists in Virginia's life, including the fact that she graduated at the top of her class. And it was custom that the top graduate would receive a scholarship to Antioch College there in uh, Yellow Springs. For whatever reason, she was not given, and I don't believe it was a discriminatory, her husband Arnold Adenoff, there, there's just no explanation as to why she didn't receive a scholarship. However, um, there was a uh, professor at Antioch who was a friend of the Hamiltons, of Virginia's parents, and he and his wife intervened and um, they reached out to the um, a foundation who ultimately sent Virginia to Antioch on scholarship. So she overcame what could have been, you know, a, a stop on her road to higher learning. She went to Antioch. Um, she took classes from a professor, Nolan Miller, who um, wrote short, short stories and, and novels and was quite an influence on Virginia. And Virginia saw herself at this time as a writer. She had been writing throughout her childhood. As she went to college, she was um, majoring in, in writing. And um, yet she saw herself as one who would write short stories and novels for adults. It was through the influence of a friend who she met during her years at Antioch that brought us the Virginia Hamilton, the children's book author that we know and love. Um, her friend was Janet Schutz, who went on to marry um, Lester Schulman. And Janet went on to New York City and got a job in the marketing department with Macmillan Publishers. 
And Janet loved a story, a short story that Virginia had written that featured a Watutsi queen. And uh, she thought the story would make an excellent story for, um, for children. And I'll get to that in a minute. And so Virginia goes to Antioch. She, she does not graduate. She was encouraged actually to go to Ohio State and learn from a writing professor there. Um, she took several classes there. It didn't graduate from Ohio State either, which it's an incredible message that here is a woman who does not actually have a, a bachelor's degree to her name, has a number of honorary doctorates, um, but she was ready. The, the professor at Ohio State said, you know, you, you have the talent. And back in the, the 50s, um, mid to late 50s, if you wanted to become published, unlike today, where you can write and become published from wherever you live, you had to go to New York City. Or New York City was really the place to be. That's where the, the connections were to be made. That's where the publishers were to be made. And in New York City, there was somebody else there who was just waiting to change Virginia's life. So Virginia moved there. She lived in an apartment. Um, she worked multiple jobs to pay her rent. Uh, she was a singer at clubs because she loved to sing. She had a beautiful voice. Uh, she taught herself accounting so she could work in an accounting firm. She was a receptionist. She, she loved the bohemian feel of the city. Um, she just she thought it was a time of, of cool jazz. She loved jazz music. She would go to one of her favorite places to go. It was not far from her apartment. It was called the Fog Spot Cafe. So let me find my um, passage that I um, I write about this meeting of Arnold Adolph. So she gradually Virginia eased into the bohemian feel of the big city, and she looked the part. She went about the city wearing a black beret, beret, a dark trench coat, and velvet slacks. I thought of myself as a young sophisticate developing into an artist, she said. She loved jazz music and befriended many musicians and singers through her own singing gigs. She enjoyed going to different clubs and listening to the musicians, wailing on their saxophones, jamming on bass, and working their magic on the piano. Uh, the five spot was just a 10-minute walk away from her apartment. It was, as I mentioned, a favorite. It was a time of cool jazz and shades worn at night, Virginia said. She fit in with the hip crowd as she sat back in her seat, relaxed while listening to jazz at the five spot. She tucked a book under one arm and sipped her drink slowly. I mean, just see her. The audience didn't applaud after a song. They snapped their fingers to show their appreciation. Kids in school visits love to do that. Virginia did the same. And one such sophisticated evening at the five spot changed her life. Virginia walked into the club to the sounds of Charlie Mingus strumming on his big old bass. Wherever Charlie played, crowds gathered. Along with being an amazing bass player, Charlie was one of the most important jazz composers, pianists, and band leaders. On this night at the five spot, cigarette smoke filled the air. Small tables pushed close to each other were filled with a wide variety of patrons, black, white, young, and old. All were there to listen to the cool jazz. The tin ceiling captured the sounds and tossed them back to customers as they tapped their toes to the music. Charlie and his band jammed on a slightly elevated stage. A bulletin board with announcements from around the village served as the stage background. Among the crowd was a handsome young poet and teacher. His name was Arnold Adolph, and he served as manager for Charlie. As manager, Arnold negotiated and coordinated Charlie's appearances and record deals. Arnold and Virginia had seen each other around town. She had made quite an impression on Arnold. She was this very distinctive young Black woman, he said, with a short cropped afro from a small town. They ran into each other in the, often in New York. She, she borrowed money from him as she was barely making ends meet. He was working as a substitute teacher for New York City Public Schools, making $26 per day. Back then, it was a decent wage. Virginia would borrow $5, which would back then be enough for a pizza and a double feature at the theater on 42nd Street, Arnold said. Virginia and Arnold, along with other friends, spent the evening at the five spot, enjoying the music together and talking between sets. As the night drew to a close, Charlie offered to give Arnold a ride home. In turn, Arnold asked Virginia if she would like a ride to her apartment. 
She had a friend with her and it was late, so Virginia accepted the ride. As Virginia and her friend exited the car, Arnold whispered, can I have your number? She gave it to him. But unlike today, when you may exchange phone numbers via cell phones, the exchange was not so simple. In 1958, phone numbers back then included a series of letters based on where the person lived, as well as actual numbers. It was a bit complicated and a little difficult to remember phone numbers without writing them down on a piece of paper. Arnold didn't have any paper. Charlie continued to try and talk to Arnold on the way home, and Arnold remained silent, trying not to forget Virginia's telephone number. He didn't. Unable to sleep, Arnold called Virginia. They talked for hours. Arnold read poetry to her. At some point in their conversations that night, Arnold knew that he had to spend the rest of his life with her. And there they are as that young couple, attractive couple, Arnold Adolph, white Jewish man, Virginia, beautiful African-American woman. She from Yellow Springs, he from the, the Bronx, um, but yet had similarities, as he, as he said, more similarities than differences. And um, they eventually moved in together and they worked on their craft. I um, remember vividly Arnold telling me the story of when they went down to a shop and they bought a door and they put it on, you know, stacked it up on boxes. And she was there at one end with her Olivetti typewriter and he was at the other. And you know, just, just working toward this goal of being published. Something significant happened to Virginia during this time frame. as you see this letter. And again, for, um, you know, kids, I share with them the, the significance and the importance of um, primary um, materials, primary resources. This letter is one of them. I know it happened in February of 1959. This is a letter from Hiram Hayden, who was the teacher of this workshop. Um, Hiram was the founder of uh, Athenaeum Publishers, and uh, to get into this workshop was a coveted thing. It wasn't easy to get into this workshop, and Virginia was accepted, and um, it was an incredible experience for her and helped uh, mold her as a writer. So here are some images of um, getting back a little bit into Virginia and Arnold's story. Um, Virginia, Arnold did follow through on that um, intent to spend the rest of his life with Virginia, and they were married in 1960 in City Hall in New York City. Um, uh, witnesses included her older brother, Bill, Virginia's um, favorite playmate when she was young out of her siblings, and Lester and Janet Schulman, again, Janet, who was instrumental in uh, Virginia's publishing career, working for Macmillan. And um, another handful of witnesses, just simple ceremony. And uh, when I'd asked Arnold if there were pictures from the ceremony, he said, nobody thought to bring a camera. And he said, there were arguments for years. He always thought that it was raining on their wedding day. Virginia always thought that there was sun. Um, they didn't have, you know, they were barely making ends meet back then. They didn't have money to take a honeymoon right away. So they um, waited until, um, Arnold finished out his school year, and then they took this really cool adventure by um, sailing on a freighter um, out of, through the St. Lawrence Seaway and over to um, the home port of this freighter, the Lealot, uh, to Bremen, Germany. And they spent six months traveling through Germany um, and Spain and France and writing along the way. So there's a picture of Virginia on this freighter. And again, there's virtually no other passengers on this. You know, it's a, it's carrying freight. It is not carrying passengers. And then I love the picture over on the right of um, Virginia relaxing um, with her wine. And then there is a picture of an Olivetti typewriter similar to what Virginia had in the early days. So then this is where Janet Schulman comes back into the significant role that she served um, in Virginia's career. Uh, Janet, again, kept kind of after Virginia to work on that short story. Um, it was called The West Field, and uh, she felt that it would really make an incredible children's book. And I remember watching an interview of Virginia where Virginia admitted that she didn't really know what a children's book was. Well, certainly she knew what a children's book was, but I don't think, I think what she was referring to was that as a writer, she didn't really know. There's certain formulas to writing 
children's books and, and language and and she just wasn't familiar. And um, so she, through this, this workshop, through conversations with Janet, through doing her own research, she taught herself um, the formulas to writing children's book, children's books. And obviously she was very successful. She ultimately had 41 books published in her lifetime. Uh, from picture books to middle grade young adults, um, several biographies, but the book that started it all was Zeely, which is the story of two young children who um, spend some time with family out on the farm in the country, and they meet this woman, Zeely, who is reminiscent of a Watsutsi queen. And what's really cool about the story is that Virginia uh, has said when asked how it is that she writes and creates the incredible stories that she did, that it all, it didn't start with a plot. It starts with character. And this character of Zeely um, stemmed from um, remembering seeing magazines that her father had. And there was an image of a real African queen on the cover of one of those magazines. And it made such an impression of Virginia that it within her mind, it created this character. So Zeely was incredibly well received. Uh, it was published in 1967. And from 1967 until she died in 2002, Virginia had um, one or two books published a year. Virginia had a new role that was happening um, during her time in New York City. Um, she became a mom. They have two children, um, Lee and Jamie. Uh, Lee was born in New York City, as I, as Jamie was as well. Uh, they were born in 64 and 67, and um, they started to raise their kids in New York City and continue to write. Virginia had several other books that were in the in the pipeline. She um, ultimately she didn't have a standard formula to writing one or the other. Oftentimes she would, just as many of us, read several books at a time. Virginia would be working on writing several books at a time. And several years into being parents of Lee and Jamie, um, they realized that New York City, New York City was changing in the late 60s. And um, it really wasn't the place to raise a family. And the call to home was very strong. And so they moved back to Yellow Springs. They built this home that is just such a cool um, structure. It, the design Virginia found in a magazine and saved it. It has sliding glass doors all around. They lived in a glass house. And um, Virginia, there's an image coming up where she would sit in her office, which was on the main floor, just off the entrance way. And she would look out at a hundred year old hedgerow. It was on the, it was on property that her family had owned. So once again, she was surrounded by family. She was back to her homeland and consequently her writing just soared, um, her story soared. And there's a picture of um, Arnold and Virginia and young Jamie there in their home. And you can see the sliding glass doors and looking out into um, their backyard. Uh, the first time that I visited the home and interviewed Arnold, he had huge tomato plants. It was summertime. He had tomato plants and basil plants in his front courtyard. And um, in their lives, I'll give you a little glimpse into what their daily lives were like. They would, um, Arnold would make coffee in the morning and uh, they would have coffee throughout the day. And oftentimes um, she would come out of her study as they refer to her office. He would come out of his study, which was up on the second floor and they'd meet and they'd kind of share conversations about what they were writing. Um, Arnold is a very accomplished um, poet himself. So they were both actively writing. Um, I read a uh, quote from Jamie about um, that experience of being raised in a home where both parents, you know, something that's very commonplace now with a pandemic going on with parents, both parents working from home, but that was their life. They worked from home, of course, as, as Virginia became more accomplished and celebrated and honored, um, they would travel more. 
Um, but for the most part, they were home and she was very dedicated. She was um, working five days a week. I think she gave herself time on the weekends to have with family, but she started in the morning and she didn't leave that study other than going and getting, you know, some food and some coffee until evening time. Very, very dedicated, very disciplined. And obviously the body of her work is a reflection of that. Um, I love how Arnold would share that from those tomato plants and from that basil, he would make a killer um, marinara sauce. And uh, so you could just smell that aroma. would love to have smelled that aroma of the marinara sauces as the sauce was bubbling and their energy and their stories were bubbling as well. Oh my goodness, MC Higgins the Great. So she had, and, and again, both within my biography and the up and coming um, work by the Library of America, you will see an extensive listing of Virginia's books. Again, 41 uh, books, um, including biographies and fantasies, mysteries. Um, but Virginia, the I don't know, it'd be difficult to say the most significant, but I would say the most recognized was her 1974 book, M.C. Higgins the Great. It is set in Appalachian, Ohio, uh, with young Mayo Cornelius Higgins, M.C. as he is known. You see this image of him sitting on top of a 40-foot pole. Uh, his home, he is that, uh, he's concerned, he's, he's fearful of losing their home, which sits on a mountain and um, strip mining is occurring. And uh, they're afraid of the spoil heap coming down and literally ridding them of their home. Um, there is a friendship that develops between MC Higgins and some uh, neighbors who live in the woods. It's it's a story of loss. It's a story of family. It's a story of strength, and it's a story that was highly recognized for uh, how incredible it was. Uh, it, Virginia, through her work, was the first. African American male or female to win the Newberry Medal, uh, which was given to her in 1975. Um, it also received um, the National Book Award and it also received the Boston Globe Horn um, Book Award. It was the first book to receive all three. I believe I might be stand corrected on this one. Jerry might know this. Um, but I believe um, Holt is the only other book that has the distinction of winning all three of those awards. Um, there is Virginia and Arnold at the um, acceptance speech, which was out in California. They traveled as a family via train. Um, Virginia didn't necessarily care to fly. She did eventually as more opportunities presented itself for her to uh, accept awards as well as make presentations. But they traveled as a family on the train. And I, re I remember this um, story of Lee, um, proudly walking through the train with a copy of MC Higgins, the book, and sharing that um, her mom had won the award for this book, and they were going to the ceremonies together as a, as a family. And I just thought that was just a really cool, fun story. So MC Higgins, the Great, published in 1974, Newberry Medal winner in 1975. So here are just a smattering of some of Virginia's works. Uh, we could talk hours for about all of the variety, but I thought these images reflect um, that diversity in her work from the House of Dyes Greer, which was her second book published. It was, um, she published a sequel to the House of Dyes Greer, but they were the only mysteries that she wrote. Arnold loved the House of Dyes Greer. It was his favorite. He'd shared with me, and I believe that her dedication in the book um, hints at that as well. Um, the Planet of Junior Brown, her stories, a collection of African folk tales, um, Sweet Whispers, Brother Rush, uh, The Girl Who Spun Gold, and The People Who Could Fly. The people who could fly were illustrated by Arnold and Virginia's dear friends, uh, the Dillons, um, who he has, um, Leo has passed, but Diane is still alive. And Diane, I shared with her that I thought her story, uh, their story is an incredible story as well. Um, so within the collection of uh, novels that the Library of America is republishing. They include Zeely, House of Dyes Dreer, 
MC Higgins the Great, Planet of Junior Brown, and Sweet Whispers Brother Rush, which in in my opinion, for as much as and I love the the folk tales, I love the picture books, um, but I believe that those five novels are her strongest work. Um, and I, I loved each of the stories. So it'll be exciting to see them all come out together. So something else that happened, and I have a quote that I want to read the um, communication between um, Virginia and uh, the organizers of uh, the um, School of Library Science and the Elementary and Secondary Education Department at Kent State University. Professors there reached out to Virginia, wrote her a letter, and suggested that they wanted to establish this conference that celebrated works for uh, multicultural works for children. And um, her the letter in its entirety will be included in the back material for um, this collection from the Library of America. I just love the letter. Her response was, um, you certainly know how to make a girl's day. I thought one had to be dead to receive such an honor. Oh, but I am glad I'm alive and I am indeed honored and overwhelmed. Is anyone ever simply whelmed and wondering who me? She means me. <laughs> to emphasize how much they valued Virginia's contributions to children's literature, the committee asked her to be the first keynote speaker. Virginia gratefully accepted the honor, readily agreeing to speak. She said, this letter sounds a bit flip my way of cloaking slightly my deep appreciation. You guys are really something up there. Know that I am profoundly touched by the thought and I will try to do justice to the first Virginia Hamilton lecture on children's literature. Well, that one lecture, um, that first lecture has now gone into over 30 years of this conference that is held at Kent State University in honor and in celebration of Virginia, her work and her passion for um, writing and encouraging works for diverse works for children. There is this beautiful po uh, poster on the right, which um, celebrates the sixth annual Virginia Hamilton Conference, illustrated by Jerry Pinckney, who was so very kind to allow me permissions to include it within the book. And he sent lovely correspondence, as did Ashley Bryan, um, which quotes from both of them. Their reflections of Virginia are included in my bio. When I first met Arnold, sat down with him in that home on Union Street in Yellow Springs and uh, spoke about Virginia, he said that she was very proud of all of the labels that she wore on her chest. Writer, mother, friend, niece, aunt, uh, educator. She taught at Ohio State University. She taught all of us as writers and readers so much. And I tried to do justice in these next couple of slides of those various roles that she served. Um, there she is with Arnold on the um, left side of the screen where she is accepting an award at, I believe, Wright State University. Um, she is there with Arnold um, doing a panel and I want to say it was with the American Library Association. I mean, she spoke at, at all of the majors, the National Council of Teachers of English, Library Association, um, Children's Book Council, et cetera. So there they are doing a rare book panel together. And I've seen, I believe, excerpts from that discussion are in speeches, essays, and conversations. And their natural, just um, their personalities <laughs> <laughs> were a reflection and their writing style was a reflection of their personality. So to see the notes from that panel, it was just, they, they were both filled with humor as well. So it was just delightful conversations. And there he is with Virginia, again, at a, a trade show um, as part of one of the, probably the American Library Association convention. Down at the lower right, there is Virginia speaking at libraries as she often would. She loved talking with children whenever time would permit. And then at the far right, there is Virginia with her word processor and her windows looking out at that 100-year-old hedgerow. Virginia embraced technology. She really enjoyed, for one who started out on a typewriter, any, any new technology that would come out, she would use. Um, here she is as wife, mother, and sister. I love this picture from 1984. Um, Virginia and Arnold having a good time dancing together. She's there in the middle with... Um, four of her siblings. She has uh, five siblings altogether. 
a picture of Arnold and Virginia on the right um, outside their home that is in the courtyard where his tomatoes and basil grew. And then on the lower left with um, Jamie and Lee. Jamie uh, followed in mom's as he made a phone call to her. Um, great story about how he made a phone call to mom and shared that he was getting into the family business. And this was at a time when Jamie was living in New York City. He was in a band and doing lots of gigs and Virginia would go and see him at all of these different gigs as would Arnold. And um, but he said, I'm joining the family business. And uh, he ultimately wrote several books himself and published and then um, stepped away from that role and into another role himself. And he is a teacher down in Yellow Springs working with um, middle grade and, and uh, high school students teaching, of all things, English down in Yellow Springs. Lee, who I have not met, uh, lives in Berlin. She is an opera singer and she now teaches singing as well. And then there's Arnold together. Very sadly, Virginia left us too soon in 2002. She had privately battled breast cancer for 10 years. Um, and many, even of her closest friends, was not aware of her battle. And it's amazing just knowing that it was a 10 year battle and to see her body of work, even from when she was diagnosed and fighting that battle, to know just how prolific she continued to be. Um, but she passed away in 2002. Um, her legacy continues in many ways through the Virginia Hamilton Conference. Through Jamie's works there, you see him at the conference with a proud Arnold watching as uh, Jamie reads from um, the first pages of one of his picture books. I mentioned the Ohio historical marker that is at the Yellow Springs Library for 41 works. Um, and she had several books that were published after her passing as well. The speeches, essays, and conversation book all tribute to her legacy. And I end my story and my presentation with perhaps Zeely, her character sums up Virginia the best. She was the days and nights put together. I would like to thank again the Sandusky Library for hosting me today, as well as my gratitude to Arnold Adolf, as always, and the Virginia Hamilton Conference on Multicultural Literature for Youth for their support. Personal photos were, have been given permission by Arnold Adolph. And I'd like to note that there is a teacher resource guide available for Virginia Hamilton, America's Storyteller on my website, which is uh, julierubini.com. Um, and as a sneak peek to all of you there, here is, um, this is the working cover of the Library of America collection of the novels. Um, I love the image they've, um, the designer artist has worked with a variety of images. I, I love the various images that I've seen for the cover. Um, so it'll be fun to see, which is the ultimately ultimate cover, but this is pretty much what it'll look like. And again, that'll be released on September 14th. It will be an 800 page volume. I mean, you've got five novels there. Um, again, some of my favorites, I think some of her best work. And it will be found in libraries and in schools and libraries and certainly for individual readers uh, after September 14th. So there we go. There is Virginia Hamilton's journey. Um, so much more that I can share and I'm more than happy to um, take a little bit of time if we have time for question and answers if you'd like. Well, thank you. And yeah, we have, I mean, I mean, we don't have all day, but I mean, we have, you know, we certainly, we certainly have time for, you know, I don't have like a strict end time or anything for this. So if anyone has questions or uh, more than more than happy to ask them, I really enjoyed it. That was, that was really Very interesting. interesting. Thank you. What an incredible story, right? I mean, just, yeah, it's just amazing. So let me see if I can get out of, there we go. Yep. You're good. Okay. You got it. Good. Uh -huh. Awesome. So I have a question. Once you decided to write about Virginia, where do you even begin? <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, begin as far as if, well, your research, our, so, I guess yeah. your research and uh, yeah, gathering the materials. Yeah. And 
I, um, I don't know how it is. I suppose for um, you to appreciate this as a fictional writer, that your story to some degree just kind of comes to you, right? I mean, you might, you just have as Virginia with your characters and then the, the plot and the story kind of lays itself out. I, you have the affinity to do that. I have attempted, <laughs> I've attempted fiction, but I really think that um, my Bellywick, uh, my specialty is nonfiction because I love to research. I seem to have this knack for finding materials. And it really begins, first and foremost, I had to start with Arnold. Um, I needed to, even before I formalized the proposal for Ohio University Press, I reached out to Arnold. Um, I had been in contact with him again through the conference, but I wanted to make sure that he was on board with this project and would be in support because I would need his help in obtaining some materials. And he was fully on board. And I, goodness, Arnold, if you hear this at some point in time, or Jamie or Lee, I can't thank the family enough for the support. Um, a friendship developed between Arnold and I throughout the process. He was kind enough to read um, through the um, revision, so that even the first draft. And I was blessed by his kind words about how lovely my prose was. And, um, you know, it's pretty tough order. <laughs> <laughs> to write about such an accomplished author. I was really, really nervous through the process of, you know, seeing reviews on the book, but um, he was incredibly supportive in knowing that I had that support. So I started with Arnold and um, I went to Yellow Springs Library. I went to the Historical Society. I um, went to, got into the archives at Kent State. I, um, th there is a lot of material out um, on, on the internet. And, I mean, there's like millions of entries for Virginia Hamilton. There were a number of interviews. Ne I never had the opportunity to meet her and it makes me so sad that I never had the chance to meet her. Um, but I felt like I got to know her um, through the process and I would like to think if she was still alive today that we would be friends and that um, she would be as Arnold has been so incredibly supportive of Claire's Day. I'm sure we would have had her at Claire's Day. Um, would have loved to have had her. She probably would have come several times to Claire's Day. So um, digging into those archives at Kent State, at um, the library, at the Historical Society, and as I offered at the start, um, I have come across some correspondence between Susan Hirschman, who was her editor, um, through her initial works, including M.C. Higgins the Great, um, that were at the University of Oregon, and I was not aware of those. So sometimes it's just getting a little creative with your searches um, on the internet that'll help point you in the right direction. I have never met a librarian or um, someone in, in archives who is not willing to help share the story of um, an important you know, individual, and certainly Virginia was no exception to that. People were very, very willing to come forward. The same with um, interviewing her friends um, and those that were peers uh, during her time from Diane Dillon to um, correspondence from Jerry Pinckney and Ashley Bryan and, uh, of course, Arnold. So um, it takes a community to write a biography and um, to, to share um, to share all of the, the potential material that can be included within a biography. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's, a, really... it's a lot of work, but I love it. I mean, I, I just love research. That's it's just to me, the research and the way that I've written each of my books is to dive into the research, dive, 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 and, you know, make sure that I organize it and catalog it. And it's almost like I absorb what I learn and in writing the story, it just comes and certainly have to, you know, refer back to various uh, materials that I found to insert quotes and, you know, help bring the story to life through, particularly in this case, through Virginia's words, because Virginia's words were um, <laughs> better to share this story than through the words of Virginia herself, both in her writings, as well as her correspondence um, and her speeches. And you'll find those intermixed throughout the biography. So I had some incredible resources. I, I, I was, I'll say I was really impressed by um... Some of the primary sources you showed off, just because I think they're they're cool that they still 
survive like the the letter for when she got into the the uh i don't remember the the uh the writing club oh, yeah, yeah the workshop yeah yeah the the workshop that was really neat and you know some of the pictures were really cool and you know it was really you know to me being on the history end of it that's to me that's really cool that those that you're able to find those and that you know the those things survived and got saved and you know that's I mean, it's important. It was important to her, but it's still one of those things that you could see getting lost or tossed aside as time went on. So to me, that that's really cool that those things existed and you got to use them and and everything. So that to me, that was that was fun. And I uh, I have received um, wonderful reviews about my writing, but just as well, I've I've received wonderful. Um, comments about my research and uh, credit to Ohio University Press. Um, I suggested that, um, you know, th their standards, their expectations as far as the documentation as to where sources, you know, came from, um, as well as the expectation of a variety of sources really um, push me in this new role as biography as biographer and um, I, I learned they um, so hats off again to um, Jillian Berkowitz who was the director of Ohio University Press at the time and who was so excited I shared the news with her I keep in touch with her she's retired and um, I sent her the news about the Library of America project and her words were just so kind um, just it's so happy for me and happy for um, future audiences to these novels, but very kind to me as far as um, deserving of the role as editor. Um, but yeah, the, um, the university press taught me well as far as um, finding those sources and documenting those sources. Something about the, um, the biography of Millie Benson, which was my first for Ohio University Press, um, one of the reviews suggested that since it was the first biography of Millie, um, that my research and that back matter would um, serve uh, future biographers well, or those who were interested in learning more about Nancy Drew or about Millie Benson or the Stratemeyer Syndicate. So, um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. And I agree, the, the research is usually the most fun part. I know that, I know that is for me when I've done stuff here for, um, for different projects and stuff is you get you get lost in it and it's just so much fun to, to find things and to learn about it and especially with stuff like you were just saying for you know that was the first biography of her so if you're the person who first person who's really researched that topic it's so much more fun because there's so much more discovery involved right and as i share with kids when i do school visits is that if you if they have an assignment to write about someone or something they have to write something nonfiction, is to find a book on that subject and go to the back of the book and that will provide them with those other resources where they can learn as well and i do that in my research um, back to the millie benson book um there were there was a great book that was sorry <laughs> Get somebody at the door. Um, there is a great book that um, was written by an author, Melanie Rehack, and it was on, um, oh gosh, I wish I could recall the title. It's in the back of my Millie Benson book, but it was about both Millie and Harriet Stratemeyer and the roles that they served in saving the Nancy Drew um, storyline. And um, so there were there, there was some biographical information about Millie and about the Stratemeyer Syndicate. So that served as a great resource, but there had never been an individual biography of Millie. So, um, so yeah, always go to when you're looking to research a certain individual or your subject, find a book and look to that back and you're gonna find a whole lot of other material that you don't save you time and energy. I like the headings that you used, um, like plot twist and turning point. Um, so that kind of organization kind of uh, struck me. So I'm wondering about the um, the the one that you're editing, the anthology of all of her her five novels. Mm -hmm. um, as an editor, do you are you going to like be are they going to be published on a bridge or do you have to, what is your role, I guess, um, as an editor in that? 
Which is a great question because that was my first question when I had the Zoom meeting with Brian McCarthy, who's the associate publisher, and Stephanie Peters, who's the um, staff editor. Um, I wanted to make sure that based on other writing projects that I have to make sure that I wasn't taking on too much and knowing that I was going to also be doing some traveling um, during their deadlines and timelines. And um, really, it was not as extensive as I thought my responsibilities, again, were to write a chronological biography, which was to be 3,500 words. I will share that. You appreciate this. It's at 6,500. <laughs> 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 yeah. I am never short for words, either in speaking <laughs> or in writing. And uh, so it's, it's uh, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll work through that. Um, but again, I just kept finding more information. And Stephanie, as an editor, was great because she kept pushing me for um, more specifics. You know, when you're writing a chronological biography, you need to know, you know, what months did this occur? What date did this occur? It's not, you know, unlike a middle grade or young adult biography where you can suggest that it happened in, in this year, um, you know, just to really dig a little and push me a little bit further as a writer, which was great. Um, so I to write the chronological biography as well as recommendations on the appendix materials and Stephanie and I were pretty much right on um, the same uh, wavelength as far as the um, speeches that Virginia had offered um, that again were in this incredible collection that Arnold put together as well as I um, I felt that that letter from Virginia to the professors at Kent State University um, was very important to include within its entirety because it is a great reflection of Virginia and it also is a reflection of the start of something that, you know, for, for 30 some years has been going on and it is unlike anything else. So um, she agreed to that. So I did not have to do, I know that um, Stephanie and um, Brian are working through um, annotating um, the work, so I was not responsible for any of that. So I, I'm not, you know, they're making sure that, of course, that they have first editions of the works. So that's what they are presenting is first because her works have been, you know, um, reprinted a number of times. So making sure they have first editions and then annotating them, and they are doing that work. I am, I am not. So it was really kind of just an overall role, if you will, in, in sharing her her journey in chronological form at the back of the book. Yeah. So, and who's to say there won't be another one because she had 41. <laughs> I think some of the feedback that I've gotten is that in my biography that admittedly um, it, there could have been more time spent on her um, sharing of the folk tales and, and that in itself was just an incredible journey. So, um, you know, it would be awesome to see those works coming back out. I have, I contribute to, and Shudi, you might as well, mixed up files of middle grade authors. Are you a contributor? Are you aware of that? I know it's a great it. blog. Um, so again, it's the mixed up files of middle grade authors. Um, I am a regular contributor. I oftentimes do new, really, I'm on the new releases team when books come out. Um, but I have a post that's coming up on this Friday, actually, and um, I kind of introduced this book coming out through this post, and I share a conversation that I had with Kwame Alexander, who I had the opportunity to meet at a Toledo Library um, event and reception prior to his presentation several years ago. I was in the process of writing the biography then, and I shared that with him, and he was so stoked. I mean, literally, as I write in my post, his eyes like lit up. He was just, and he was trying to figure out, I could see the wheels turning in his head, how he might try and be able to step away from his book tour, which this presentation was in the middle of, and get down to Yellow Springs and hang out with Arnold Adolph, because, you know, Kwame is a poet as well, an incredible writer. And I do know that Arnold and Kwame have connected since that point. Um, so I reached out to, so in this conver initial conversation with Kwame, um, I shared with him the biography. We talked about, you know, diversity, a call for diversity in um, stories for children. And um, during, after his presentation, during the question and answer period, um, that subject came up and he said, you know, we will always need to have and we should have books that are diverse because our re readers are so diverse. 
But he said, we also need to recognize and pay heed to what's already on our shelves. And uh, I took that as a reference, even though he didn't name Virginia, just having spoken with him about Virginia is kind of a hats off to Virginia and her work. So, you know, back to Library of America, her works will be no longer in tattered paperbacks that kids have been enjoying for years, but now in a new big book that they can read all of these works. So it's, it's very exciting. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So what happened um, with? Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was, I was. Uh, go ahead. Your question. I was just going to ask you um, about Clara's Day this year. Did you do a virtual thing, or did it not happen, or what's the status of? Well, no, so that's it's so hard. We did not have Clara's Day this past year, and in the conversation on the way down here to North Carolina with our executive director, we have determined that we will not have Clara's Day this year either. We will simply celebrate the 20th as we're referring it to as the 20th, because it would be and then some um, spring of 2022. Um, you know, there's just still so much unknown and, you know, teachers, Jeremy, a big part of our program is to recognize children who are selected by their schools as being the most improved readers in their classes and um, teachers, reading specialists, principals nominate these children, select these children. Every child who is nominated receives a personalized certificate and they receive a coupon to um, select their very own book at um, the festival, which Judy, I'm not sure if that was even the case. We used to just give the kids a book and then we realized that, you know, we are recognizing children now from kindergarten through eighth grade and beyond. And, you know, to just choose one book, it's not a one size fits all. So this empowered children to choose their very own book by the authors and the illustrators participating in Claire's Day, because those are the only books that are available at Claire's Day. And, um, you know, teachers are overwhelmed right now with, you know, in school, out of school, virtual, live, the uncertainty. I, I just, my heart goes out to um, teachers. It's very difficult. And we did not want to make life even more difficult for them by asking them to do this in support of the program as hundreds of teachers have done over the years. The program has grown to the point where we have recognized the last three years over 1200 children. Um, you know, a lot of these kids are, this is going to be their first book in their home library. Um, a lot of these kids have never been celebrated for any academic achievement. It is so empowering and such an incredible program. And we, we didn't want the experience to be any less for any child who might be nominated this year and might, you know, have to do virtual or something. So we're just taking a step back and we'll be back in spring of 2022. Um, we've grown to three different festival sites. We've been out at the Defiance Library. We've been at Main Library downtown Toledo, and as always, at the flagship at Mommy Library. So, so yeah, we'll we'll be big and strong in spring of 2022, and and looking forward to that. Well, I will too. <laughs> Yeah. And maybe Jeremy, I have to admit, I have been past your library. I've never been in your library. So perhaps you'll have to have me come back when the world opens up and I'll I'll do some other presentation on Millie or or whatever, you know, on, on Clear's Day or or on Christine Brennan. So we, we would love that. It would we okay. we miss not uh, we miss uh not being able to get not just the general public in, but you know, speakers in and stuff. And you know, right. uh Judy could tell you. Normally, our brown bags get more than this as our, you know, when we have in person programming, we usually get a good 20, 30 people in. Um, so I do, I do, I do feel a little bad that we can't do it in person. Uh, but so, yeah, definitely once we're kind of, you know, back in the in person programming phase, we will definitely have to have, have you come back in. That'll, um, we would love to have that. Well, that's great. Thank you. Was really that cool library. <laughs> What's that? I said that's a really cool library. I bet it is. I bet it is. Yeah. We right. are. Right. We're very happy because we are a we are a Carnegie Library, so it's really neat that we you know have expanded and you can still see even though we've expanded beyond our original Car Carnegie roots, you can still see very clearly the Carnegie Library and feel that, and it really is um, wonderful and. You know, we go the building, the original building was built in 1901. 
Uh, we wow. opened in 1901, um, and we've been in the same place ever since. So we are uh, quite happy. And actually, we just did a little bit of um, restoration that made our Carnegie side look even more like we did in 1901. Uh, oh, wow. That's very we, cool. And yeah, all we, the Mommy Library is um, still, even though I'm, I'm living now in Toledo versus Mommy, but just a stone's throw away from Mommy. Um, Mommy Library, of course, was where we um, went with our children and was the original and still remains again as the, the flagship of Claire's Day, if you will, but it too is a Carnegie Library. Um, the outside resembles more than the inside of um, the reflection of that history, and I'm so glad that they've kept that. It's beautiful inside, but I have to say a part of me misses the old book smell. You know, it just that went away with the renovations and, you know, going down into the basement for children's story time area. They have a beautiful children's story time room. So, um, but yeah, it's it's a lot easier. I, I remember there were steps going to the main entrance and having, you know, three little ones, including one in a stroller, making up those, you know, 10, 15 steps to get to the main entrance and books. I had always allowed my kids as many books as they could carry. And of course, that was generally actually more than what they could carry, trying to make it back into the library with all these books and the stroller and kids and all of that. So grateful for the easier access. But yeah, there's a lot to be said for our beautiful historic libraries that we have. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, for again to the Sandusky Library for hosting me today. Judy, so great to see you again. And um, hopefully through with having recorded the program that'll have more exposure to other participants. And um, I look forward to seeing you both hopefully in person soon. Okay. Yes. And thank you once again for doing, uh, for coming and doing this program for us. And like you said, hopefully we'll be able to get together soon and have you for another program. Uh, All right, but, so. but thank you, Julie, for coming. And uh, thank you, the rest of you, for joining us for this uh, lovely program. And hope you enjoy the rest of your week. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Bye, -bye. Bye Julie. Take care. Bye-bye.